Greetings, friends. It's your boy, Mark Gray. Thanks for hanging out with us. Somewhere between black and white, there is that shade of gray. And welcome to the gray area. And inside the gray area on this day is a second generation public servant. If the last name Ivy is familiar to you, that would be Glenn Ivy's son, who happened to have been a former state's attorney in Prince George's County. Mother is also a serving member, Jolene Ivy, in Prince George's County uh, politics. So Julian Ivy arrives to Annapolis with a pedigree and is calling for a state house of representatives general assembly special session to address certain things that are going on with the pandemic crisis that we face now in the free state and he joins us right now as we uh move it along first off thanks for taking the time to join me uh how are you hanging in there during this pandemic well thank you so much mark for having me on uh it's really important that we have this discussion uh, because I'll be honest with you, I'm doing fine. Uh, my parents, they're doing fine as well. Um, and that's a privilege, that's a blessing right now during this pandemic. And it's not something that every Marylander can say is the case for themselves or for their families. Um, we have so many issues that are taking place at, at the same time, multiple crises. Uh, and so we have to break down what different people are going through um, to be able to have a holistic vision of what's taking place right now, what's the reality of the state of Maryland. And if you look at all the different issues, if you look at not only the largest protest movement in American history, as the New York Times report, reported, uh, not only uh, is this possibly a mass eviction and foreclosure crisis that we're looking at again in the state of Maryland, remember Prince George's County, we just barely uh, got out of the, the last foreclosure crisis. Many of us have not recovered still. Um, and now to also look uh, at the fact that we have an election cycle that's coming up. We have the general election uh, and our Republican governor has decided that we should be having to send in an application to receive a mail-in ballot rather than just allowing us to use the same process that we just used in the primary. He could have made a few changes to how many precincts were open in different jurisdictions, but you know, instead he's opening up as if um, you know, coronavirus isn't quite as serious as it is. Um, he's asking individuals to, to volunteer at precincts on election day who are typically older individuals um, to, to sit down in an, in an enclosed place uh, where just hundreds of people will be coming through the doors uh, to come and vote. And, you know, it's putting people at danger uh, it's putting people's health at risk, uh, and it's unavoidable. It's avoidable, quite frankly. Uh, we, the General Assembly, we have the authority to call for special sessions, uh, and I believe that during the 2020 international pandemic, uh, during the largest protest movement in American history, uh, when people could be losing their homes, uh, when frontline workers have been working uh, without proper PPE, uh, aren't going to be receiving hazard pay as we move forward. I mean, we could just talk for hours about any one of these issues and really dive deep into it. Uh, but instead, what we're deciding to do is to ask Governor Hogan to use the authority that he does have. He could sign executive orders to do a lot of what we're, we're talking about, um, but he's a Republican. And I think that people forget that sometimes um, because, you know, he's a kind guy. It's easy to, to like him. He's a likable individual, uh, but he's a real estate developer who owns residential property. So when we talk about extending a moratorium on foreclosures and evictions, we, he could possibly be saying to himself, when I sign this order, I'm myself gonna lose tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands, we don't know what that number would be. Uh, but it, it, we have to remember he's a Republican and the Republican party doesn't always have the same interest uh, as the Democratic party to say the very least. So in this moment, as Democrats, I, I represent Prince George's County, which is going through the coronavirus. Uh, we, I mean, everyone's going through it, but we've been hit hard.
I don't know if you can hear me, but we seem to be having a little bit of a. Logan uh, is not about to change his ways. Okay, uh, we're having a little bit of an issue right now in terms of the audio. I'm hoping that you okay. can still hear me. Okay, uh, hear you. there's a lot of meat on that bone, so let's get right to it. Uh, yeah. You talked about the reality of the state of Maryland right now. As you see it, what is the harsh reality facing us right now uh, in particular, most of all, to uh, certainly working, middle, uh, even upper-class individuals? Well, let's just talk about pre-coronavirus, pre-pandemic, right? When people were still able to go to work, uh, but they were still behind on their payments. They were still struggling, even before this large crisis that we're in the middle of now. Uh, so now you add on top of that struggle, just a huge obstacle uh, that is the coronavirus crisis. And so many people are being impacted in their own ways. Right now, uh, the governor, uh, some time ago, he did uh, sign an executive order uh, to make it so individuals who are behind on their payments because of coronavirus, but remember, that's a loophole right there, um, that they would be able to not, they, they wouldn't be able to be evicted or foreclosed on. Uh, but that is a loophole that allows for people who are already struggling before coronavirus, who are already in the queue to be foreclosed on and evicted, to be evicted or foreclosed on during this pandemic. Uh, so individuals who are already struggling, I mean, of course, this is not making it any better. But then we have a separate issue, and that is there are individuals who weren't struggling prior to, and now they're filing for unemployment, and when the coronavirus crisis does lift, uh, they're still going to struggle getting uh, their job back uh, if that job is still there, and it'll be tough to get a job that's paying quite as much uh, in the future. We saw the foreclosure crisis back in 2009. A lot of that was to do with subprime loans, uh, but that's not the issue here. The issue here is that individuals who prior to this crisis were doing just fine are now on unemployment benefits. Uh, they're unable to pay their mortgages. These are individuals who have been doing you know, everything that you can do the right way, but hey, who really has six to nine months of emergency money saved up. Let's just be honest about it, right? And so no one would ever expect a crisis like this to, to hit us here in the United States of America. And by the way, we're, we're getting hit the hardest because of our public health um, decisions that we have made at this point. Um, but so, you know, just to take a step back and understand that there were people who were struggling beforehand, and now it's even worse. There were people who were doing just fine beforehand, and now they're struggling. And so we as a government have the obligation to step in uh, to try and do as much as we can to keep people from losing their homes and falling further and further behind. There are things the state of Maryland can do. We talked a little bit about extending moratoriums on uh, mortgages. Um, and canceling evictions for the foreseeable future. But the federal government will have to step in and extend forbearances on these loans uh, so that we can figure it out down the line so that when this public health crisis is lifted, people aren't hit with a massive 10 months of mortgage payments that they missed all at once. And, and can I jump into that point? Because yes. I, I, we've got to talk about the potential for raising taxes, which is now making headlines in the county. A, nobody would appear to right. want to see it, but the harsh reality is there's been a significant uh, revenue decrease due to coronavirus. So, uh, virus. Right. so on the one hand, nobody wants property taxes to go up, right. but how do you recoup the revenue lost if you don't raise taxes? You know, I, I think that is a perfectly fair question. Um, it's a great point, but I think at the end of the day, we have to remember what government is here for and that's to help the people that uh, it consists of. Because without the people, there's no government. Without the people putting into the government, we don't have any any revenue that we can spend. Like We, we absolutely need the people. Uh, we're their voice, and I believe we should be thinking of them first. And right now, when we're already going through this foreclosure and eviction crisis, we, we just talked about that for some time. And that's not inflicted by Prince George's County or Baltimore City or any any specific local jurisdiction. This is something that the world is just going through. And so that's that's something that we can address. 
we can't allow for self-inflicted wounds to cause individuals to lose their homes so that we can raise revenue for any specific purpose. At this point, I think that it's time for us to look at the government itself uh, to see if there is a way that we can better directly help keep people in their homes um, throughout this crisis. And this is the first time in modern history that we've gone through a crisis of this magnitude with a, a budget of this size. And I just know that um, there is enough money to help the people right now. We just have to make some tough decisions. You made, Lou, uh, a couple of things that almost reek of voter suppression as it relates to yeah. counting down to election time in terms mm -hmm. of breaking away from a process that was already in place. In the interest of full disclosure, I'm an independent register-wide. So primary, I can't vote in Prince George's County, which right. is a topic for another conversation down the road. However, uh, yeah. a, as it relates to, um, and that's a broad term, it's a loaded term, but yeah. um, you know, if you stand on the outside looking in, would it be unfair to categorize what you're talking about that may be in place as a form of voter suppression by the aforementioned Republican mayor? I mean, governor in your words? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a, a Certainly a form of voter suppression. Uh, and whether or not he would go out and, and speak about it in that way, I, I don't assume so. Uh, he hasn't quite uh, done that thus far. But you have to look at the facts. In the primary, we saw record turnout, uh, and it was using this mail-in system, and sure, it was flawed, and it took some time to get the final results, but when we got the final results, turnout was up across the state. Uh, and so as a Republican and a Democrat stronghold who is now They're already going to say uh, that he's a, a, Demo a Republican in name only. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I got you now. Okay. Yeah, Get they're back. already going to come at him and say he's not conservative enough. Um, and so he's looking to get right with the Republican Trumpian party at this point. Um, so, you know, he can't go so far uh, to, to champion outright voter suppression um, because that would go against his brand as well as a moderate uh, who, who wants to focus on fiscal issues. Um, but if you just look at the reality uh, and the fact that he's making this change going against uh, the recommendations of, of health officials uh, and, and county executives and the mayor of Baltimore City uh, from these large jurisdictions, uh, it's just clear what he's looking to do, uh, which is lower turnout for Democrats, I personally believe. Um, and you can see the why as well as he's looking to make himself out to be more of a conservative uh, with the Republican electorate. Talk to me for a second about those executive orders, if you could. Executive mm -hmm. orders that you think would benefit the people immediately that could be executed by the governor. Right. So first and foremost, just because foreclosures, it's such a big deal in Prince George County. Always, it, it has been for the last decade. And hopefully we don't allow for it to be another second wave of foreclosures as we move forward. Uh, he signed an executive sense of urgency uh, behind this specific piece of the issue. Uh, July 25th, we're going to see people who, yeah, they were already behind. It doesn't even say how much behind you had to be. But now, because you, had, you were behind a little bit, and now these several months have just compiled, now you're, you're ready uh, to go in the queue. So that's one very basic one that he could uh, clear up, rather, uh, because he already did it. He just put in a loophole and that's what he needs to do away with. He could do that by executive order. Um, another would be uh, to make the election cycle, uh, up, the upcoming election be more similar to the primary election cycle that we just went through, uh, to mail in people's ballots to their homes, mail them directly to registered voters, regardless if they request an absentee. 
uh, because that's the process that he's asking us to go through right now. Uh, that first you have to send in a request, which costs money for any local uh, board of election to actually process the request. That takes man hours to go through and now put you in the queue to send you your physical ballot. And now when the voter gets their ballot, they have to send it back to the board of election, which again, costs money. Uh, and, and so this is gonna be a more expensive version of an election that we just went through. Uh, and he could easily uh, make those changes via executive order. Also, uh, we need to talk about utilities because those are starting to rack up as well. People are still using the heat. Uh, they're still using electricity and so on and so forth. And um, we need to extend the moratorium on those payments as well. Um, and we also need him. I, I really hate begging the governor to do any of this because we should be going into a special session to do all of these things. I don't believe that he uh, has it in his mind to do any of these that we've talked about and we've already talked about kind of why, but this last one is so significant. Remember, this is 2020. This is the heart of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, New York Times says this is the largest protest movement in the history of the nation. He needs to sign executive orders on police brutality, accountability, and transparency. 99 Democrats, uh, I'm included in this list. Um, we sent him a letter urging him to make several executive orders. Some of them just real simple, uh, establishing use of force standard, uh, making it so that lethal force uh, has to be used as a last resort, um, making it so that officers can't shoot at moving vehicles, banning chokeholds, like very common sense, straightforward things. Um, and he still has refused to send us a response uh, to that letter. 99 Democrats. It only takes uh, 71 of us to go back into special session right now, and it takes 85 of us to override his veto. And, and to that point, I'll let you yeah. get the uh, go uh, on this one. Uh, has there been pushback on what you're proposing, or would you say it's just falling on deaf ears? And does that have something to do, quite frankly, with your age? Do you think your age, in terms of pushing an argument that seems to have some merits, the planks in this platform would seem to be strong, objectively speaking, Yet because you're young, because you're a new G trying to convince the OGs, is there some difficult <laughs> with that? Difficulty with it, pardon. You know, I really respect all my colleagues and I know that they um, view me in a positive light as well. Um, I've had many conversations with them um, and it, it's not so much about my age, it's not so much about issue either. Um, I, I think that there's some behind the door conversations taking place and I hope that they will uh, wrap up quickly and call for the special session uh, as soon as possible. Um, but that, as for why we haven't gotten there yet, I, I can't really speak on behalf of my colleagues. I can't speak on behalf of leadership. I was only elected to represent the 47th district in Prince George's County and that district's hurting. Um, we're going through this crisis and as their representative, it's my duty to speak up on their behalf uh, because I went to them personally and I asked for their support and I came back to their door two, three, four more times and they said, this young man, yeah, he was 22 at the time when he came to my door and he said he would fight for me. And you know what? When we started going through a crisis, when we needed someone to stand up and be our champion, that's exactly what he did. Uh, so much money to write what is the six executive orders that we're talking about he could get that done in one afternoon but he's resisting and so at this point it, it's incumbent upon us as the voice of the people uh, to go and do the people's work he is julian ivy the prince george's county house of delegates representative from the 47th district second generation public servant and doing himself proud and hey, keep the doors up uh, to the gray area open my friend we're looking Absolutely. forward to seeing how you can affect some change because there are a number of different issues that we appreciate you 
uh, bringing to the fore. And quite frankly, now, I would like to hear what the other side has to say. Please. Because there, there's yeah, some legitimate please. issues that really need to be discussed. And hopefully we can, uh, as we move this thing forward, trying to get out of the pandemic and uh, towards the election, that we may be able to do just that right here in the gray area. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you, sir. I'll see you soon. And that's going to close the book on this edition of the gray area. Remember, as always, somewhere between black and white, there is that shade of gray. And as we move it along, please be advised to remain properly socially distant. Wash your hands, mask up, and by all means, give somebody you love a hug tonight. You may not get a chance to do it tomorrow. Till next time, I am Mark Gray. That's Mark with a K, Gray with an A. Find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram all over the place in cyberspace on a computer, smartphone, tablet, however you get your social media groove on. Till next time, may you go in peace.